Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. Uh, my name is Keith Benny. I'm part of the learning team here at TIFF. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's screening of The Matrix with an extended introduction from Kale Keegan. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that this afternoon's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Uh, we are grateful to have the opportunity to gather together in this space. On behalf of TIFF, I'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, Ontario Creates, and the Canada Council for the Arts. As a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members for supporting our TIFF year-round activities and making our educational and community outreach events uh, possible. Thank you to Classic FM Radio and Zoomer Radio, who are our program sponsors. And thank you very much to our friends at Warner Brothers for providing us with the film. We are very excited to be screening this afternoon's film on 35mm. So you're in for a big treat. <laughs> Uh, this afternoon's event is the final in our Cinematheque retrospective 1999 Movies at the Millennium. Uh, when we look back on the films included, films like Fight Club, uh, Being John Malkovich, Magnolia, we are reminded of the quality movie going that was available to us uh, back in 1999. Um, and when we look more closely at the films, uh, like we're, we're about to do here with Kale, um, we see a reflection of some of our collective curiosity and anxiety about change, social, technological shifts that we anticipated uh, at the time of, of the new millennium. And so it's within that context that we're thrilled to screen The Matrix today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest who will reflect on this film and its place in the career of Lana and Lily Wachowski. Uh, Kel Keegan is Assistant Professor of Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies and Liberal Studies at Grand Valley State University. He has been interviewed on LGBTQ art and cinema by NPR, The Advocate, NBC, Vice, and Slash Film. Kale also appears in the Vice Guide to Film episode, New Trans Cinema. His writing has appeared in Queer Studies in Media and Popular Culture, Spectator, Media Culture, and the Home, uh, Journal of Homosexuality. He is the author of a fantastic new book, Lana and Lily Wachowski, Sensing Transgender. Uh, the book has recently sold out in our TIFF shop, but we do hope to have copies available next week. Um, if you're interested in purchasing, there's uh, some postcards here down on the stage that will tell you how you can order the book. Uh, Kale and I first met at the Society for Cinema and Media Studies conference last year, and ever since, uh, we've been looking for an opportunity to bring him here to the Lightbox uh, to celebrate this new book, and I can't think of a better opportunity on the 20th anniversary of The Matrix to revisit this film together, and through Kale's groundbreaking work, to watch and understand the film in a new way. So please join me in welcoming Kale Keegan. Thank you so much to everyone who's come out to see this film. I'm just so thrilled to see all of you out here in the audience, and I want to especially thank Keith, Amy, Jessica, Teresa, and everyone else I've worked with to make this event happen, to be here. Um, it's my pleasure to talk about one of my favorite films, um, and a film I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about recently. Um, so to prepare this talk, I started thinking about 20 years later, um, what new is there that can be said about The Matrix? Introducing a film with such a deep and rich literature and such a broad cultural impact seems like a paradoxical proposition. There is so much to say that ironically there is nothing that seems most immediately pressing to offer. And yet, we are all here together to experience this film. Clearly, something about The Matrix still captures the popular imagination even as so many of its once sensational ideas have become the stuff of our everyday lives. My approach here today is therefore to play a kind of trick by revealing new meaning from within an object we think we already know. I'm going to propose briefly to you this afternoon why and how this film still contains surprises and what new meaning we might make from it. And much of what I'll discuss here is, is um, explored at, l at longer length in the book that Keith just mentioned on the Wachowski's total body of cinema. Today, we know that The Matrix's critical success and unfolding virality across global popular culture has fundamentally impacted the common themes, look, and techniques of mainstream film and television. Even if we have not seen The Matrix, we have still witnessed its impacts on media production and aesthetics. Digital imaging innovations developed for the Matrix franchise, like bullet time and virtual camera, 
have subsequently become industrialized by Hollywood, permanently altering cinematic representations of time, space, and embodiment. Film studies scholarship continues to revisit the matrix to extend already rich discussions of its craftsmanship and its depiction of race. But the film has also been widely analyzed for its exploration of postmodernity, its religious undertones, its transmedia platforming across movies, video games, and comics, and its representation of the virtual realities associated with the rise of internet culture. Multiple studies situate The Matrix as a threshold text, as a film that visually defined the advent of the 21st century, introducing a new multicultural utopianism and illustrating the approaching convergence of film production with uh, and, um, and video gaming and, and, and the internet with video li uh, everyday life. So there's kind of a convergence happening in the film. And I just wanted to ask, before I go any further, is there anyone here who hasn't seen this film? Oh, Lord. Okay. Some of you haven't seen it. Okay. Well, I was instructed to av avoid spoilers anyway, but I will say that you've, have tw you've had 20 years. <laughs> so, you know, if I ruin anything, it's kind of your fault. Um, I've actually often thought that one of the reasons many younger people have not seen this film, uh, like all of you who raised your hands, is because we are now living inside many of the effects that in 1999, The Matrix helped us to anticipate. Sometimes the most visionary science fiction ends up becoming nonfiction and through its own prescience loses its speculative charge. However, what we didn't know in 1999 that we know now is that the film is the first example of a blockbuster cinematic work produced by transgender writers and directors, the Wachowski sisters, who have since its release become the world's most influential transgender media producers. Given this recent destabilization of who we might have assumed The Matrix's creators are, I want to invite you to watch this film through two new lenses, which together restage some of the major tensions and contradictions internal to it in new ways. So the first lens is one of identity, through which we might reconsider The Matrix as a text authored by transgender creators, a film that appears at the precise historical moment when transgender identity politics were emerging into mainstream North American discourse. For example, looking back, we notice how The Matrix was released the same year as Boys Don't Cry, which electrified audiences with its depiction of the life and early death of transgender youth Brand and Tina. Considering The Matrix alongside Boys Don't Cry, as well as other contemporaneous films, such as All About My Mother and Being John Malkovich, provides a fascinating example of how ideas about transgender identities were influencing the center of the millennial cultural imaginary. Through the lens of uh, transgender identity politics, it becomes important to claim the matrix as the most significant cultural text yet created by transgender people. While identity has always been an important theme in the matrix, naming the text as a film that is at least partially about transgender identification transforms it into another kind of cultural and historical milestone. Naming is, of course, an important issue for transgender people ourselves. A theme narrativized in the film by Agent Smith's repeated misnaming of Neo as Mr. Anderson. And I think the problem of naming, the conundrum it, pr it produces, is you know, evident across the history of the Wachowskis' work. Um, I'm, since this is 35 millimeter, I'm assuming at the end of the film we'll see the title card come up, Wachowski Brothers, right, as the directors, even though that is not the name the Wachowskis use today which is why I've put it here. So trans communities have actually long pointed out how the Matrix's plot follows the sequence of dysphoria, identity realization, name change, hormonal therapy, surgery, and social reintegration in a new gender that is today so recognizable as the medically mandated pathway for gender transition. In perhaps the most direct example of this resonance, the film's iconic red pill, blue pill scene between Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, and Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, replays the scenario of transgender diagnosis. The red pill stands in for the perceptually and physically transformative effects of hormone therapy, while Morpheus performs the clinical role of therapist, analyzing the transgender subject's sense that something is wrong with the world. So there's a long history of trans communities online actually interpreting this scenario as a scenario of diagnosis and identity realization, right? Where Morpheus is able to tell Neo why he doesn't feel right um, and that 
the problem isn't him. The problem is the perceptive scripts of reality are off, right? Like, um, and this is a kind of sensation that trans people have long kind of found um, resonant with our own experiences of gender. Um, unrecognized by mainstream culture without the necessary conditions, though, the revelation of the Wachowskis' own identities as transgender now make these trans qualities of the matrix sensationally historically perceivable. But let's be real. It's never been the plot of the matrix that has been its most astounding original feature. The matrix's narrative and, and dia, uh, diegesis have always been secondary to how the film looks. It is the aesthetics of the film that make everything else about it work. And frankly, it is the aesthetics we remember. So let me offer a second lens through which we might hang on to the question of transgender identity while paying renewed attention to how this film affects our senses. Through a second lens focused on the film's uh, effects design, we might also consider how The Matrix offers popular audiences not simply a narrative of transgender identification, but a radically new aesthetic that proceeds from a transgender point of perception. The Matrix does indeed follow a story of identity realization, but along the way it also reorganizes our senses through groundbreaking special effects that alter our perception of time, space, and the body, so that the concept of discrete identities is everywhere challenged and exceeded. Attention to the film's aesthetic design thus helps us grasp something unique that the Wachowskis have offered to cinema production history. A marriage of speculative narrativity and emblematic aesthetics that teaches audiences about what it might feel like to experience more than one body, to move through time and space outside of the established rules for reality, or to sense things that others cannot perceive as real. This aesthetic lens moves us outside the simple proposition of the film being really about transgender identification toward the larger question of what aesthetic worlds a transgender popular cinema might make possible to imagine, as well as the effects of those aesthetics on us in the audience. Through this aesthetic lens, I would invite you to think of The Matrix's effects design not simply as spectacle, but as a sensorial invitation to a set of ideas ones that ask us to sense transgender as a new way of arranging reality itself. Perhaps the most iconic of these effects is the film's phenomenal refinement of bullet time. This is an effect called for in the Wachowski's first script that splits time spent moving the camera from time passing in the frame, giving us the sensation of two temporalities at once an effect resonant with the experience of gender transition and its multiple embodiments across time. Speaking at DePaul University in 2014, Lana Wachowski noted of the effect, quote, we were trying to find a way to express the delimitation of reality. So we were talking about how every audience member has a relationship to a camera move being related to time and space. So you have to move a camera through space and it takes a certain amount of time. We talked about could you put a camera on a rocket? We talked about how do you begin to express the kind of idea we were looking for, of being able to push at the boundaries of reality." Unquote. In this comment, Wachowski describes bullet time not merely as an aesthetic effect, but as the visual incitement of a larger premise, an expansion of what is possible for the sensorium and its perceptions under the dictates of formal space and time. So, the paradox I'll present you um, through the I'll present to you through these two lenses is this: Is the Matrix an unprecedented example of previously unrecognized transgender authors making a blockbuster transgender hero narrative? Because I kind of like that interpretation. Or, isn't it an example of how the cinematic expansion of perceived realities that the film achieves? might lead to new modes of imagining and expressing one's own embodiment or one's own gender. Did the Wachowskis make a secretly transgender film? Or did this film make available new sensations that have led to changes in how we understand the possibilities of the body and of gender? Perhaps, like Neo himself within the film, The Matrix occupies a temporal conundrum in which these are simultaneous and codependent truths, neither more real than the other. These paradoxical formations are as central to the experience of living as a transgender person as they are to the interrelated processes by which our senses organize cinema 
and cinema organizes our senses. So I'll leave you then with the moment in the film that offers itself most equally to these two lenses, identity, aesthetics. The moment when its diegesis most overtly singles, signals a transgender identity politics, even as its visual effects seek to explode our sense of the available categories for identity itself. In a looped pattern common to many of the Wachowski's works, this scene repeats the structure of the film's first sequence. A cursor blinks on a black screen as Neo calls into the machine mainframe. The trace code that also begins the film, um, the four, first four words of the film are call, trans, opt, received. Um, again, pops up suggesting the new availability of, of transgender identification. The mainframe picks up the call and Neo delivers his revolutionary message. I know you're out there. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. No rage against the machine. If you know them, I cut that out. <laughs> that will happen later. Um, so what I love about this scene is that while Neo's ma manifesto is delivered from the stance of a revolutionary identity claim... The scene's special effects communicate a sensational pressing beyond the systems that produce identities themselves. As he makes the utopian claim of the speech, stating, a world where anything is possible, the virtual camera transits through the negative space between the coded layers of the M and F, those highly identifiable markers of medical and legal gender, and into the blackness beyond. Where we go remains an open question. It's not yet clear what the radical changes in technology, embodiment, and gender we have lived through in the two decades since the film's release will deliver. Welcome, again, to the edge of the real. Please enjoy The Matrix.